John chapter 6, verses 10 to 15. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the man sat down, in number about 5,000. Jesus then took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and disciples to those who were seated. Likewise, also the fish as much as they wanted. When they were filled, he said to the disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Uh, So we are coming back into John chapter 6. And um, maybe to begin with, one of the most important thoughts that the Gospel of John is presenting to us, maybe one of the most important questions that's being asked of us, is whether or not we will or whether or not we are Receiving Jesus. Are we receiving Jesus? Right? That's John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, that he came unto his own, those who were supposed to be his very people. He came unto his own, and they did not receive him. But to those who did receive him, to them he gave the right or the authority to become children of God. He gave them all the authority that they needed to revel in the blessing of being a son or daughter of God Almighty, those who received him. So the entire gospel is written for that purpose, that we would be confronted with this question, am I receiving Jesus or not? And maybe to um, make that question even more specific, The Gospel of John not only asks us, are you receiving Jesus, but more specifically, the Gospel of John asks us, are you receiving Jesus as Jesus presents himself to you? Not as you might want Jesus to be. That is, are you receiving Jesus and are you willing to receive Jesus as he is, not as you might imagine him to be according to your own ideas of what he ought to be, but are you humbly submitting yourself to Jesus as he presents himself to you and receiving him for who he is? The lesson that we're going to take away today from John 6 verses 14 and 15, is simple, and I'm going to state it here just so that I make sure that it's said clearly, just in case I don't say it as clearly through the rest of the message. The lesson we take away from John 6, verses 14 and 15 is simple. We either receive Jesus as he is, that is, we we either receive Jesus as he presents himself to us, or we will be rejected by him. But put it a different way, you either receive Jesus as he presents himself to you, or he will not receive you, right? And that's ultimately what matters. Ultimately, what what matters is, is not whether you are willing to accept Jesus. What ultimately matters is, is Jesus willing to accept you? Is he willing to receive you? The Gospel of John presents that question to us. And it's a question that each one of us has to answer before we check out of this life and go to stand before Christ in all of his glory. Last time we were looking in John 6, we saw the details relating to Jesus' miracle of feeding the 5,000. And uh, we were noticing 
what the Holy Spirit intends for us to see in that miracle. Right? Noticing the language of verses 10 and 11 and on through the rest of that section, there's a connection that's made between the language as it appears in John 6 and the themes that are present there and the language that's used in Psalm 23 and the themes that are present there. And, and what we're to take away from that is Jesus here in John 6 is, is unpacking the fullness of, of what it means for him to come and to be our Savior. It means that he comes and embodies the fullness of the glory of what it means for Yahweh to be the shepherd of his people. What does it mean for the Lord to be my shepherd and for me not to have anything lacking in my relationship with him? Well, Jesus is putting that on display right here in John 6. That he is the Lord, our shepherd. And for all who come to him in faith, those who turn from their sin and receive him with empty hands, not offering him anything, but simply receiving from him what he promises to give us to everyone who responds to his call to believe in his name like that, they will never experience a moment where they will have lack in their relationship with him. Jesus is the good shepherd. And that's what this miracle is presenting to us. And, and by the way, I don't have time to go into this today. I was going to. But there's an even clearer connection between Yahweh as the shepherd of his people and that shepherding care being administered through the hands of the Messiah. And that's in Ezekiel chapter 34. And you can go read about that later. But there you see where, where Yahweh swears, I will be the shepherd of my people over and against all the false shepherds of Israel. I will come and I will deal with these false shepherds and I will be their shepherd. Oh, and by the way, I will appoint over my people one shepherd, my servant David. And he will feed my flock on the mountains of Israel and in good pastures. Isn't that what we see happening here in John 6, the Messiah sitting down with God's people, feeding them on the, the mountains of Israel, John says, these Golan Heights just to the east of the Sea of Galilee, rising sharply from the, sea, uh, from the, from the shoreline, feeding them rich food and green pastures. <clears throat> now that's what, the, that's what the, the Lord intends for us to see and what John, through the Holy Spirit, is intending for us to see in this miracle. But in John 6, verses 14 and 15, we find that in seeing this miracle, this crowd got really excited. However, their excitement was not rooted in who this miracle proved Jesus to be. Their excitement was over what Jesus could do, and more specifically, their excitement was over what Jesus could do for us, right? What we could have Jesus do for us. Wow, look what Jesus can do. He must be the prophet. Let's go make him our king, and then we will get this power to have everything that we've ever wanted. We'll unpack that a little more fully as we go on, but that's what we see in this passage. We see Jesus, after his miracle being done, being viewed by this crowd as the miracle worker who can be used as the king of the people. And as we're going to see in the passage, Jesus will not be used as a means to anyone else's end. He rejects that kind of fascination with him because that is not true faith. It's not receiving him for who he is, but for what he can do for us. And may the Lord help any of us from believing in Jesus like that and coming to him like that. And with that in mind, let's pray and ask for that very blessing. Heavenly Father, we do sense the temptation to come to you and to draw near to the Lord Jesus simply to have our own expectations and our own desires met. Lord, even at times when those expectations and those desires are good things, we confess that sometimes we can treat you as if you are a means to our ends. And Lord, we, we confess that with shame in your presence. And we are humiliated 
by the kind of cravings and yearnings that have come out of us. And the kinds of things that we've expected you to do for us. The kinds of ways we've, it, we've thought we could use you for something. Lord, I pray that you would keep us from walking in that kind of mentality moving forward. That your spirit would come this morning and sanctify our hearts for the sake of Christ's glory, for the praise of your name, Lord, so that we would be a people who do not receive Jesus because of what we think he can do for us, but receive Jesus for the glory of who he is, because we see his beauty and we revel in his majesty and in his splendor, and we behold his glory. And in beholding, we worship. God, may that characterize and define us here at Oak Ridge Community Church more than anything else. We pray for that blessing and that you would work it in each one of our hearts here this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we get into this, notice with me, first of all, in verses 14 and 15, the crowd's reaction to Jesus' miracle. How does the crowd react to Jesus' miracle? Well, verse 14 begins by saying, Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Now, a number of things I want to point out from those verses, uh, hopefully briefly. (laughs) We'll see. Number one, notice that the crowd realized something true about Jesus through the miracle. The crowd realized something true about Jesus through the miracle. They saw him do this miracle, and that made them realize that he must be the prophet who was coming into the world. Now, were they wrong in their assessment? No, they weren't wrong. Jesus' miracle was, in fact, proving that he was the prophet who was coming into the world. Now, this, this reference, the prophet, that's obviously referring back to Deuteronomy 18.15, right, where, where Moses told the people of Israel that the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, from among you, from among your uh, countrymen, or literally from among your brothers, is what it says there. And you shall listen to him. That's the charge. The Lord will raise up for you a prophet who's going to be like me, and you shall listen to him. You see the same thing in verses 18 and 19, where the Lord himself, Yahweh himself says to Moses, I will raise up a prophet like you from among their countrymen, their brethren, And I will put my words in his mouth, and he will speak to them all I command him. And it shall come about, whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself shall require it of him. That's that's a serious threat, right? I don't want to have to stand before Yahweh and give an account for why I would not listen to the Son of God when he came to speak to me the words of God. Well, that's what the Lord promised his people. Another prophet is coming. He's going to be a prophet like Moses. I'm going to put my words in his mouth. And the expectation of God's people is that they would listen to what he had to say. And when the crowd saw Jesus doing this miracle, they thought, well, this must be the guy. This must be him. Right now, why would they think that? Why would they see Jesus performing a miracle of of multiplying bread and providing uh, food through the fish for the crowd? Why would there be a connection between that and Moses in their minds? Well, here's one who's like Moses. He must be the prophet. Well, I think we see the answer to that, right, in John 6, 30 and 31, where it seems like the crowd made this connection between the prophecy of Deuteronomy 18 and what Jesus had done in this miracle because of Jesus providing the food for the crowd, right? It was the food that made the connection between Jesus 
and Moses. And the rest of the chapter is going to go on to talk about the relationship between the, the bread that was provided by the Lord through Moses and how Jesus has now come as true living bread for the people. Right? So, so Moses, right? Hadn't the Lord provided bread and meat through Moses? Right? It was, there was manna, and it was, it was under Moses, but there was manna, and then there was also what? What was the meat? It was a quail, right? The Lord provided bread and meat through Moses. Well, well here, Jesus has, has just unfolded for them, this multiplied for them bread out of the five barley loaves, and he has multiplied the fish, these two small fish. He's multiplied it for all the crowd, and there's this connection. Wait a second. We're in this, we're in this kind of um, secluded place, just kind of like... The people of Israel were in the wilderness with Moses, and the Lord provided food for the people of Israel through Moses, and now we have food provided for us through Jesus. Jesus must be that prophet. Maybe that's how they reasoned. You know, even the prophet Elisha, right, had done a miracle very similar to the feeding of the 5,000. He even used barley loaves, we're told, in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 42 and 43. He told a man to set before a hundred men 20 barley loaves so that the men might eat. And the man said, well, what are 20 barley loaves for so many people? And yet by the miracle of the Lord, the men ate and they were all filled and they had left over, right? Well, even so with Jesus. Jesus multiplied the five barley loaves and, and everyone ate as much as they desired. And then there was an abundance that had been left over. These, these, these similarities between what Jesus has done here and the prophets who had come prior to Jesus as recorded in the Old Testament, that's what's making this connection in the minds of the people. The only difference is Jesus performed this miracle on a much larger scale and in a much more powerful way than either Elisha or Moses had done. Right? And so he was demonstrating through that that he himself was greater than either of them. And so the Jews uh, seemed to get that message. The, the prophet had finally come, and he was standing right in front of them. So they recognized something true about Jesus through this miracle. But notice, secondly, how they reacted to this realization, or that how they responded in light of this realization. Verse 15, seeing Jesus do this miracle thinking that the prophet had finally come, that Moses had spoken about, they then determined that they were going to take him by force and they were going to make him king. I don't know if you know this, but Jesus will not be handled that way. No one will take him by force and make him do anything. Who do you think you're dealing with? It's very interesting language in this verse, actually. This is, this is very strong language. Take him by force. The NASB translates this one Greek word as take him by force. Uh, that word maybe more literally would mean or, or more simply would mean to snatch or to seize someone or something. It has the, the, the idea of snatching something suddenly and vehement, or, uh, vehemently, right? Is that how you guys say it up here? Vehemently? Or is it vehemently? Okay. I try to navigate the differences between our cultures, and some of them just can't be navigated. But vehemently. Right? So to, to really, it's to grab someone in such a way, when it's being applied to a person, this word really gets across the idea that you're grabbing that person in such a way so as to take control of that person and make that person do what you want that person to do. And what did they want to make Jesus do? Well, they wanted to make him their king. They wanted to make him be the king that they wanted him to be. That's why they were seizing him. Now, isn't that a good desire? Isn't that a right desire? Isn't Jesus king? So was it wrong for them to want to take Jesus and make him their king? Was that a wrong desire or a wrong impulse? 
Well, no, not necessarily. So long as you let Jesus define what that means. That's what becomes the issue here. It's not that Jesus isn't the prophet. And it's not that Jesus isn't the king. Excuse my double negatives, Miss Helen. That's not the issue. The issue is that they were redefining what it meant for Jesus to be that prophet and what it meant for Jesus to be the king. See, they wanted Jesus to be king on their terms. They were not willing to receive Jesus as king on his terms. And that's the issue. And this is the, the very issue with every single sinner in this world who is confronted with Jesus. Will you have Jesus on your terms or will you have Jesus on his terms? It's the battle of the will, right? Whose will is ultimate? Whose will is supreme? Is it yours or is it Jesus' will? But we know in this chapter the Jews were not willing to receive Jesus as king on his terms. They were only willing to receive him as king on their terms. How do we know that? Well, in a couple of ways. First of all, we know that because of the language that's used here, right? They're going to seize him. They're going to make him do something. Obviously, that's not taking a humble or submissive posture under Christ as the prophet, right? That, that's what the Lord demanded or commanded his people to do when that prophet arrived. He says, I'm going to put my words in the prophet's mouth, and what are the people supposed to do? They're supposed to take a submissive posture under him and listen to what he has to say. That's not what the people are doing here. They're taking an active role and seeking to make Jesus into something more than what Jesus is presenting himself to be. That's a problem. Really, they're taking this domineering posture towards Jesus. They're trying to seize him, make him what they expected him to be. They were not showing a willingness simply to receive him as he is. But with force and severity, they wanted to dominate him and make him what they wanted him to be. And Jesus will not be used like that. He will not be a means to someone else's end, as I've said already. And we see that. This is the second way we know that they were not willing to receive Jesus on his terms because of the way Jesus responds to their reaction. They reacted to the miracle by saying, hey, this is the prophet. Hey, this is the king. Let's take him down to Jerusalem and let's make him our king. Finally got what we want. The kingdoms being restored to Israel in all its glory and fullness. And Jesus, in verse 15 Rather than acknowledging that and embracing that desire, he withdraws from them. They were not willing to have him as he presented himself to them. They wanted him to be something other than what he was. And so he rejects them. Now that leads to our second point, main point for the day. And the final point, believe it or not. But this goes on for a minute. We see how the crowd reacted or responded to the miracle. But why does Jesus reject the crowd? Why does he reject them? We've already, obviously I've already hinted at that. It's because they're not willing to embrace him on his terms. But more specifically, to, like, to really unpack what they were expecting him to be and what Jesus was not willing to be. The reason why Jesus rejected them, why he rejected this crowd's desire to make him their king, was because he would not be the kind of king, nor was his the kind of kingdom that they were looking for. Jesus wouldn't be the kind of king that they wanted him to be. He would not usher in the kind of kingdom that they were expecting the Messiah to bring. As John Calvin said, they had rightly learned from the word of God that he who was promised to be the redeemer would be a king. They, they learned that. They heard that rightly from the Old Testament. Their problem was that they misinterpreted what that meant. 
So, for example, they read Zechariah 9 and 10, right? Uh, your king, behold, he's coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. And then in verse 10, it speaks about that king decimating armies uh, and, and destroying uh, battlements that are, that are arrayed against the people of the Lord in the promised land. And they interpret that as saying, when the Messiah comes, he's going to decimate the nations of the Gentiles. He's finally going to exalt Israel above all the nations, and everyone's going to know their rightful place under Israel. Or Psalm 2, right? God's anointed Messiah. He's the one who is set on Zion, His holy hill, as king. Who is, what is that king going to do according to Psalm 2? Well, he's, he's going to ask of his father, and his father is going to give him as an inheritance the nations of the world. I don't know if you know that, but all the nations of the world belong to Jesus as his inheritance. And what's he going to do to them? Those who will not humbly and joyfully and reverently worship him and kiss the sun. He's going to shatter them like earthenware vessels with a rod of iron. His scepter will break them and shatter them into pieces. They read statements like that. They read Daniel 2, verse 44. <clears throat> We're, we're told that the Messiah's kingdom, when it comes, it would crush and put to an end all the kingdoms of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, right? The king of Babylon had a dream, and there was this statue made of different kinds of materials. And then all of a sudden, there was this stone that was cut out of a mountain without hands. And that stone was hurled at the base of that statue, and it all came crumbling down. And Daniel interprets that dream for Nebuchadnezzar in, 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 in giving him an understanding that what's going to happen is one day after all of these kingdoms come to pass, establish and set up a kingdom that will never pass away, a kingdom that will endure to the very end. In fact, a kingdom that will bring to ruin all of these other kingdoms that have been seen in the dream. Right, so that's the kingdom of Babylon. That's the Medo Persians. That's the, the, the kingdom of Greece. And then... What's the fourth one there? What? Rome. Is that what she said? Yes, yeah, the kingdom of, of the Romans. The fourth kingdom. Oh, by the way, who's reigning over the people of Israel during Jesus' ministry? Rome. Doesn't this verse say that when the Messiah comes, He's going to decimate the kingdom of Rome? That's how it's rightly interpreted. Well, here's this crowd. They read these passages in the Old Testament. They saw Jesus do this miracle. They knew that it proved Him to be the prophet and the king. And so they were ready to take Jesus down to Jerusalem and declare Him to be their king. And then like Jonah, right? They were ready to take their seat off to the side and watch the king set up his kingdom and decimate the Romans, baby. Let's get rid of those Romans. World power, world conquering kingdom. That's what we're waiting on. Show those Gentiles their rightful place. Get them underneath our feet, Messiah. That's where they went wrong. They didn't understand the kind of king that the Son of God came to be, nor did they understand the kind of kingdom that he came to establish in this world. You might remember what Jesus says to Pilate in John 18, 36, right? What's that? Somebody say something. Ah, I hear some weird things up here. This, this, is, uh, this is different. I know it may be hard to believe, but this is really different, preaching in, in the room now. It's just, I don't like it. Uh, I don't think we can go back, but. You remember what Jesus said to Pilate in John 18, verse 36. When Pilate asked, he's examining Jesus, and he asked Jesus, are you a king? Well, part of Jesus' response to that is, yes, I'm, I'm a king. It's as you say. But my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting so that I would not be delivered into the hands of the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Literally, it's not from here. 
Now, when Christ says that to Pilate, he's not merely saying that his kingdom does not derive from the kingdoms of the world. What he's saying is that his kingdom is not at all like the kingdoms of the world. So it's, it's not just a different kingdom in degree, right? It's not like he has a kingdom that's just the same as all the other kingdoms, but it's greater and it's more powerful. That's not what Jesus is saying here. What he's saying is it's not only different in degree, it's different in its quality. His kingdom is not of this world. It's not like the kingdoms of this world. It's different in its quality. It is a spiritual kingdom. It is a heavenly kingdom that in some measure has now broken in upon this ungodly world. But it's not here in its fullness. And it's not going to be ushered in in its fullness the way that earthly kingdoms would be ushered into new domain or new territories. It's not the way it works. It's a spiritual heavenly kingdom, and that's not what these Jews wanted, right? They, were looking, they weren't looking for a heavenly kingdom. They were looking for an earthly kingdom. They were looking for a kingdom that was fully here and, and now, one that would satisfy all of their carnal, worldly expectations of what would come to pass once the Messiah King arrived. And Jesus is going to say that very thing to them in John 6.26. Jesus says in John 6.26, you aren't seeking me because you recognize who I am through this sign. You're seeking me because I've given you food and your bellies are full. Who is ultimately the one to whom they're devoted at that, in that moment? It's not Jesus as king. It's their own bellies, Right? Their God is their belly. They, they're serving their own appetites. And because their idol is their own appetite, even Jesus becomes a means of satisfying and serving their idol. Now, I don't want to be extreme in what I'm saying here about the kingdom of heaven not being like the kingdom of the world, kingdoms of the world. Does the kingdom of heaven have an impact upon the kingdoms of this world? Absolutely. It absolutely does. America, the, the nation of America is, is an expression of that reality, whether you want to acknowledge that or not. You, you go read John Jay and, and some, of our, some of our first Supreme Court justices. They're constantly quoting the Bible to justify and vindicate decisions that are being made in court. Yes, the kingdom of heaven has a radical impact upon the kingdoms of this world. However, the kingdom of heaven is not advanced and it does not gain territory or domain by the sword of men as the Jews imagined that it would. The kingdom of heaven is spread with the sword of God, being wielded by the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. Right? The kingdom of heaven is not spread by the strength and crafty scheming of men. It's spread by the power of the Holy Spirit through the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel. And, and you got to get this. This is, this is the most devastating power that the king of heaven wields against the kingdoms of the earth. This is the most devastating power. Not the overthrow and, and the pouring down of, 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 of brimstone and, and, and fire from heaven like Sodom and Gomorrah. That's not the most powerful way that the Messiah conquers the kingdoms of this world. The power that is superior to that which the kingdoms of men possess is what the, is what the Messiah is wielding, which is why none of the kingdoms of the world have ever been able to stop the advancement of his kingdom. It's a power that does not compete with earthly and spiritually uh, <clears throat> demonic powers on their level or in the same way that they fight. No, the Messiah wields a power that overthrows and undermines the power of earthly kingdoms from within. From within the very borders of those earthly kingdoms. Not by subjugating the peoples at the point of the sword, but by infiltrating those earthly domains with the message of the kingdom of heaven. I'm just 
going to set this here, and what it picks up, it picks up. I don't want to hold it anymore. <clears throat> See, the power that the Messiah wields, it's not a power that we might imagine some other kingdom of the earth wielding. And therefore, it's not a power that can be overthrown by all the might and all the force of the kingdoms of the earth. This is why the Lord Jesus has established and planted a church in North Korea. It's a testimony to the fact that North Korea, the North Korean government, cannot compete with the power of the Messiah whenever he chooses to wield it. This is why even our own government and all of its growing opposition to true biblical Christianity, wanting to keep it in the closet, keep it hushed up, keep it quiet, keep it down, don't bring it into the public square. Our own government will never succeed in its opposition to the King of Glory. And so we, have, we, we can have all the boldness that we want to have in Jesus our King in declaring to our very government officials that they will give an answer to this King. And they will never overthrow his rule or his dominion. See, the power of the king is, is manifest most magnanimously, most majestically even, by the fact that he conquers people that belong to the domain of the kingdoms of the earth with a message, not with threats. He claims them as his own, and he receives their allegiance to his throne even while they are living under the rule of the earthly kings. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this, this is amazing, and I hope that you begin to understand something of the ma majestic nature of your walk with Christ. You, you, if you are a Christian, you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven by the power of the Messiah. That wasn't, a, that wasn't like a decision that you made just to choose one religion over and against all these other religions. And then it's like a cherry on the top of your life. And you go about living this segmented, compartmentalized life for Christ. You live your life out in the world. You go to work. You meet with your friends. You do your thing. But Jesus doesn't come into that. He belongs over here in this file cabinet that belongs to the church. That's not the power of the Messiah. When Jesus comes upon someone and radically changes their life... All of their life gets changed and submitted and subjugated to the king of glory. That's the kind of kingdom that Jesus came to bring into the world right now. A kingdom that conquers and overthrows the rule of governments over individual people's lives by setting them free and liberating them through the gospel of hope. The gospel of redemption through the blood of Christ. <clears throat> but that's not the kind of king. Nor is that the kind of kingdom that these Jews were seeking. And by the end of chapter 6, <clears throat> all but 12 of these roughly 15 to 20,000 people are going to abandon this one whom they wanted to make king and leave him. How many people reject Jesus for the same reason that these Jews did in John 6? <clears throat> can I just say something here in relation to that? Can, can someone give me some water, please? Thanks, thanks, Micah. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is the genius of how the Lord has begun to usher in the kingdom of heaven into this age. Just think about it. Everyone who wants a king like what the Jews wanted Jesus to be, everyone wants a king like the Jews wanted Jesus to be king, right? Everyone wants that kind of king. A kind of king that provides everything that you want and serves all of your carnal desires. And, and, and if Jesus had come into the world saying to everyone, everyone follow me and I'll give you whatever you want. 
I'll be the kind of king that you want me to be, no matter what it is. I'll give you the money. I'll give you the homes. I'll give you the lands. I'll give you health. I'll give you prosperity. You're never going to get sick. You're never going to suffer. You're always going to have an abundance of food. If Jesus came into the world proclaiming his kingship like that and appealing to people to come be his subjects in that way, everyone would say yes. But their allegiance to him would only be, or would, would be only as shallow as their enjoyment of his gifts. And once those gifts are removed, where is their commitment to Jesus? It's gone. Everybody wants a paradise on earth here and now. But that's not what Jesus promised to give us in this age. If that was the kind of kingdom Jesus came to set up here in the age that's now, then God would become nothing more than a means of satisfying our own fleshly carnal desires. That's how these Jews were treating Jesus, and my friends, we can often be guilty of treating Jesus in the same way. We can serve Christ as our king when he gives us what we want, And when he does everything that we expect him to do. But what about when he doesn't give us what we want and he doesn't do what we expect him to do? What about when Jesus isn't the king that we expect him to be? Or might expect him to be? There are many ways that people today follow a Jesus like that. And they follow him for all the wrong reasons. I've got four that I'm going to list. I'm sure you could think of many, many more. You know, many follow Jesus, they, or they follow the, the health, wealth, prosperity Jesus. Right? They follow the Jesus. They only serve Jesus for what they think they can get out of him. Right? And we've already said Jesus is not going to be anyone's savior king on those terms. Jesus never promised to deliver us from suffering in this age. What he did promise is that he would sanctify our suffering in this age so that it would become a tool that makes us fit for the age to come. There should be an amen on that. You know, because what that means is your suffering is not meaningless. Your suffering and your trials and the hardships that you face in this life, the pain that you will have to go through all the days that you live in this fallen world, none of it is without purpose. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, the Lord reveals to us right there that all the suffering that the people of Christ endure is only making them fit for the kingdom of heaven. Jesus promises that not one ounce of your suffering will be wasted. It's producing for you an eternal weight of glory beyond comparison. Some only follow Jesus for the health, the wealth, and the prosperity. And when that health and wealth and prosperity doesn't come through in the name of Jesus, what happens to their commitment to the king? Well, this isn't the king I was asking for. This isn't what I signed up for. I I don't want that kind of king. Maybe there are others within what we might call the charismatic movement Not everybody, but maybe many who only want to serve Jesus when he displays constant miracle-working power, showing off his power to the people, right? Right? And if miracles aren't taking place, then Jesus isn't there. And how, how is that different than what the Jews were expecting Jesus to be and to do here in John 6? This is the one I wanted to get to. Maybe there are others like these Jews who are looking for Jesus to usher in a political kingdom in the world that is here and now. But that's not what Jesus came to accomplish in this age. Now, I mean no offense to my brothers who may lean more post-millennial 
in their eschatology. I love my post-meal brothers, and I respect much about the position of post-millennialism, but I wonder if many people are buying into that position because of what it promises to give them. Right? It's no, it's no accident that the rise in the idea that the political entities of the world will eventually be conquered and redeployed as Christendom. It's, it's no accident that that kind of conviction is rising at the same time when believers in the West are experiencing more instability and less confidence in our governments. Do you follow me there? It's no accident that the rise in the idea that the political entities of the world will eventually be conquered and redeployed as Christendom. It's no accident that that conviction is growing in a time when believers in the West are experiencing more instability and less confidence in our governments. But can that not be coming out of the same desire that these Jews had in John 6, that kind of commitment to Jesus that will see the world made into basically a paradise of righteousness before Jesus comes. Isn't that what the Jews wanted Jesus to be in the here and in the now? A revolutionary Messiah King who would exalt his kingdom and his people in this age that is now rather than as he promised in the age that is to come. Now, we all long for a world in which righteousness dwells, right? Who wants to live in a world where unrighteousness is the norm? Nobody. We, we hate injustice. We, we hate it in all of its expressions and in all of its forms. We hate unrighteousness. Those of us who have had hearts born again to love righteousness, we hate unrighteousness. But doesn't 2 Peter 3.13 tell us that the Lord has promised to give us a world in which righteousness dwells that's not going to come until the new heaven and the new earth? It's coming, and Jesus will establish that kind of kingdom over the earth. But we're told in Scripture that it will not take place until the new heaven and new earth come. Or what about just the average Christian who comes to Jesus simply because they think that is the key to getting an easy, comfortable, pain-free life? That's how I get my job. That's how I get that car. That's, that's how I, I, I get a comfortable living in this world. And, and that represents the blessing of God on my life. All my bills are paid. My bank account is growing. I've got a wonderful family. Nice dog. I do love my dog, Baxter. I got, I got an amazing house. Praise God. A, a, a wonderful lot. All of this is proof that I am being faithful to the king because I have this kind of life. Well, that's a fairly shallow commitment, right? And it's manifest. The shallowness of that commitment is manifest when all those things are taken away. When your child dies, everyone's faith is going to be rocked. But it's those who truly know the king of glory who will not turn away from him when he chooses to take that which he's given. When you lose your job, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are in sin or that the Lord has abandoned you. It's just part of this life and what the Lord has ordained for you to walk through so that you might learn more what it means to walk in a humble and dependent faith on Him, not yourself. Right? I mean, isn't that what the scriptures tell us? That the Christian life is not ever promised to be an easy, comfortable life. Acts 14, 22, it's, it's through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. That means that the kingdom of God is there. 
And I'm here, and in order for me to get from here to there, there are many tribulations I must pass through. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, it is given to believers. It's, this is viewed as a privilege. It's given to believers. It's a gift from God to believers. Not only that they would believe in Jesus, but also that they would suffer for his name's sake. That's your privilege, Christian, in this life, in the age that's now. It is given to you to suffer for the sake of the king of glory. And to count it a privilege to suffer for his name. Isn't that what we see in the apostles? That's how we conquer, right? Revelation 12, 10. We, we overcome through the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony and by not loving our lives even to the point of death. That's how the Christian conquers, through dying in faithfulness to Jesus. John 16, 33. The Lord promised, in this world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In other words, the world doesn't get the last say on the matter. The suffering that we're going to experience, even unto martyrdom, is not going to be the last word over your life. Jesus has risen from the dead, conquering death and hell and sin and everything that would keep you in the grave. Jesus is going to show himself as the mighty conqueror on your behalf one day. He gets the last word, not death, not suffering, not tribulation. Philippians chapter 4 and Hebrews chapter 11. It's not even about having full bellies and comfortable, pain-free life. It's about being, or it's about learning contentment in Christ and setting all of our hope on the grace that's going to be revealed to us on the last day. You know, all kinds of people seek Jesus for all kinds of wrong reasons. And here's what we all need to take to heart in light of what we see here in this passage. When you seek Jesus for the wrong reason, he will always walk away from you. He will always withdraw. So, in closing, here's a question. How can we know whether we are among those who are seeking Jesus for the wrong reasons or for the right reasons? How can we discern whether our faith is genuine and a faith that Jesus draws near to or whether our faith is false and one that Jesus withdraws from? Well, here's the test. And I, I am indebted to Pastor John Piper for setting this test before me years ago. Here's the test. How can you tell the difference what ultimately satisfies you? What ultimately are you seeking from Jesus? That's the question. Are you seeking for Jesus to gratify the desires that every other unregenerate person in this world has? Or are you seeking Jesus to satisfy a new and a holy craving and yearning for the glory of God? Are you seeking Jesus because your soul has been awakened to see him for who he truly is? And your heart has been changed and filled with new desires that are longing after him? Or do you still have those old, carnal, fleshly desires that you're seeking Jesus so that he might satisfy them? You know, this is what Jesus is going to present to us over and over again in the gospel of John. This is the test that we're going to be confronted with all the way through this gospel. Jesus says in John 6, he is the living bread who comes down out of heaven. Let me ask you the question, do you have a hunger? Do you have a craving to eat the bread that Jesus came to give? Or do you want different bread? Do you want different kind of bread? The, the bread that the world can give you. Christians, this is the difference between true and false disciples. True disciples have been enabled by the Holy Spirit not only to hear Jesus tell us that he is bread, but they have actually been awakened to see that Jesus is living bread. 
They've been awakened to see that he is God's heavenly bread who has come down from heaven to satisfy our hungry souls. And it causes us to turn away from all the bread that the world offers and to run with steadfast heart unto the Lord Jesus that we might be satisfied in him. Living bread. Jesus says he is the light of of the world. Let me ask you the question, do you like and do you love and do you long for the light of Jesus to shine in upon your life? Or do you spend your time trying to hide away from the light of Jesus to stay in your darkness where you're comfortable with your sin? The true disciple, he's been awakened to see, she has been awakened to see even, The light of God shining through Jesus Christ, a light that exposes us and makes us see what we really are. The darkness that's in our own hearts. And rather than shaming us in a way that makes us run from that light, the Spirit of God enables us to run further to the light. Jesus said, I'm the door. True believers are those who have been awakened to see the bondage to sin and decay and destruction and death that is in the world and at the same time have had their eyes, the eyes of their heart illuminated so that they see Jesus as the door into heavenly glory and to life with God. Jesus says, I'm the true vine. I am the true life-giving vine. And true disciples find their souls, that their souls have been awakened to see the emptiness of their sin and and that all the bread that the world offers us is, is at the cost of our own souls and will never satisfy. True believers have been awakened by the Holy Spirit ministering the glory of Christ to our souls and enabling us to taste and to know in our own hearts the satisfaction and the life that comes from being planted and rooted in Jesus Christ. True believers, in other words, have been awakened to taste the goodness of Jesus and they spend the rest of their lives chasing down another taste. I need to have more. I need to know Jesus more. I need to press after him more. I need to turn from my sin more that I might not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. I want more fellowship with God. I want to walk in his light more fully. I want more of my life turned over to Jesus. I want to be a better servant for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I want my life to be an expression of his praise. That's the heart of a Christian. The heart of a false disciple is, well, I'm here on church on Sunday. Isn't that what Jesus wants? Read my Bible this week. I paid my tithe, preacher. Leave me alone. Don't talk to me about my sin. Don't make me uncomfortable. Don't ever make me doubt whether I'm a true believer or not. That's the heart of an unbeliever who's deceived. This is the test. What are you seeking? What does your soul crave? Jesus as a king who will get you whatever you want. In other words, Jesus as the bread giver. Or are you seeking Jesus as the bread? Your answer to that question will reveal the state of your soul. And whether or not Jesus is drawing near to you or withdrawing from you. Now, my friend, one final question. Will you have Jesus as he gives himself to you? Without trying to make him something that he's not. Something that he has not promised to be for you. Will you love Jesus for who he is? And will you cherish the gift that he is as given to us from the Father? Or will you only come to him if he meets your expectations and satisfies your own personal desires? There is true life and light and fellowship with Christ for all who will renounce the bread of the world in order to have him as the living bread. And so I plead with you to receive him as he presents himself to you. Any who come to him 
Jesus promises, I will never cast you out. Come to me, you who thirst and hunger. Come and buy bread. Drink of the living water. Why do you spend your money for that which does not satisfy? Father, help us come to Jesus because Jesus is the one that satisfies. He is the one who deserves our worship and our praise. Lord Jesus, you are the king of glory. And I pray that you would keep us from receiving you on our terms and having faith in you according to our own expectations. Lord, help us have biblical expectations and come to you in true and living faith. God, I ask for your people here that they would be blessed, that they would be richly blessed as they draw near to you, that you would satisfy their souls as the true king of glory. I pray for those who do not know you here. God, that you would awaken them from from whatever is keeping them from seeing the glory of God shining in the face of Christ. Father, would you please speak the light of the gospel into their hearts and help them see and know you and, and worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, as we, as we sing this hymn of response in light of the message today, would you please help us sing it with full hearts, with sincerity, and with, with lips that are filled with praise for your holy name. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. For the benediction, hear the call of Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2. Ho, everyone who thirst, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, says the Lord, and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. And we have that abundance given to us richly through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So may you come to him and receive that abundance in its fullness. Amen. Amen. May you go in peace.